of brain. As a part of our neuroanatomy series, we are coming to the fag end of the series. Uh, we only have a few more classes left where we'll concentrate on the cranial nerve nuclei and the cadaveric image discussion, I think, which is very important and which will definitely help us. The core features of Oracle here at Oracle, we offer live classes, recorded sessions, notes, and MCQs. In the live classes, we have an educator coming online and uh, they teach you live and you can join the meetings and you can ask any questions you can get your live clar uh, uh, doubts clarified in in live classes and if you want to learn more if you feel like you haven't understood something in the live class you can always go to recording sessions these videos are of very very good quality and uh, the content that is there in these videos is more than enough for you to ace your uh, uh, theory as well as your entrance examination and we also offer you uh, crisp and comprehensive notes that is based on the recent CBME curriculum and uh, we also have MCQs which will help you to uh, ace your upcoming next examination because next is all going to be integrated uh, uh, you know uh, subjects and everything and these mcqs will definitely help you with that and live classes also help you to make you stay in track you know in case you feel like you're going off track and these one one and a half hours of uh, time that you spend in live classes are going to hold you accountable and um, they, you will be uh, staying on track and uh, the best of all is the personalized counseling session that we have where you will be given a mentor and a buddy. So they will be like your friend. You can share anything and everything with them, which is academic or otherwise. And uh, uh, they will analyze your strengths, your weaknesses and where you're good at, where you lack. And they'll give you a proper study plan that is tailored for you alone. And uh, uh, they will hold your hands and make sure that you ace your uh, exams we have three different subscription models. In the basic model, we have pre-recorded sessions, live classes, and quick revision examination modules. And uh, in the standard subscription plan, we also have live doubt clarification sessions and along with all the live classes and pre-recorded sessions. Premium plan is like all-in-one kind of a plan wherein you get pre-recorded class, notes, live classes, live doubt clarification, one-on-one -on -one personalized guidance, quick revision examination module. And uh, you can use my coupon code Dr. Sushma20 for any additional discounts across all three subscription plans. This is the schedule that we have and we are ending the thalamus today. And from to tomorrow, we are starting with cranial nerve nuclei. And uh, yes, let let's look at the clinical case scenario. So basically, we have a... 55-year-old male patient who presents to the emergency department with sudden onset of severe headache. Okay. On examination, the patient appears to be disoriented, look at the words, and is unable to follow commands. Okay. On neurological examination, I see that there is right-sided weakness and numbness of the body. So what is it? We have right-sided paralysis of the body. And we have left-sided facial paralysis along with slurring of speech, along with disturbance in speech. His family reports a history of hypertension and smoking. Which of the following arteries is most likely involved in the patient's presentation? By looking at the clinical case scenario, I can say that number one, pyramidal tract is involved. Number two, facial nerve is also involved and there is slurring of speech as well. This looks like a classical case of middle cerebral artery stroke. This is a classical case of MCA stroke. If it is anterior cerebral artery, we're going to be having, and you know, as, as in we study the blood supply of brain, you understand different manifestations of the stroke when different arteries are involved. But right now, remember that this kind of presentation you know this is a classical mca stroke presentation which you as a doctor should be able to pick up you know if you have a patient who is coming to with the deviation of mouth to one side and there is slurring of speech and the uh, patient complains of uh, you know numbness or any weakness in the body you should be able to pick up these symptoms before it gets blown into a full stroke Okay, so giving looking at this particular case scenario, I can say that this looks like a 
middle cerebral artery stroke okay let's go to blood supply of brain before that let's get over with the thalamus so what is thalamus thalamus is an egg shaped structure in the middle of the brain it is also known as the relay station of incoming of all motor and sensory information thalamus basically this is that egg shaped structure that i am talking about this structure that i am marking over here is the thalamus this is situated between the two between two what sorry third ventricle is situated between these two thalamus isn't it so all our sensory all our motor tracts both ascending and descending tracts have to pass through thalamus except for one that is smell every sensory tract every sensory tract whether you take example pain whether you take temperature whether you take vibration whether you take proprioception all of these sensory tracts name any sensation that we have all of this will have to pass through thalamus from thalamus they go into the cerebral cortex area number 312 so this thalamus is what is called as the relay station it is the relay station where all our sensory motor tracts pass through but what is that one sensation that does not go through thalamus it is the olfaction olfactory pathway is the only pathway that bypasses the thalamus whether it is your body your face any any body wall sensation will have to go through thalamus from thalamus you have the third order neurons arising okay yes now thalamus is a part of diencephalon i hope you have some idea about what diencephalon telencephalon metencephalon and all of these i don't have time to explain it because we have lot of things to cover thalamus is a part of diencephalon okay diencephalon is divided into four regions thalamus hypothalamus epithalamus and subthalamus so if this is the thalamus this is going to be the hypothalamus and of course you can see the midbrain pons and medulla and some cranial nerves coming out here thalamus is a part of diencephalon and diencephalon has all these four different regions what are those thalamus hypothalamus epithalamus and ventral thalamus okay now what is the location and relations of thalamus thalamus lies medially in the cerebrum right if if uh, you know if i have to say if this is the brain if if i am taking a section and if i am looking at the sagittal section of the brain thalamus lies somewhere here it lies in the middle of the brain bounded medially by the third ventricle so basically third ventricle thalamus surrounds both third ventricle sorry both the thalamus surround the third ventricle if this is the third ventricle thalamus is present on either side third ventricle is actually sandwiched between two thalamus okay laterally it is bounded by the internal capsule and basal ganglia ventrally it is continuous with the sub thalamus i'll probably show this in a section now look at it this guys what is this black black structure that we are seeing this black black structure is my ventricles this black structure that you are seeing over here is the ventricles why is it black because it has csf this structure that i am seeing over here is the third ventricle this is the third ventricle and what surrounds the third ventricle both the thalamus now this this structure that i am marking over here is the thalamus thalamus is bounded medially by the third ventricle laterally by the internal capsule the one that i am marking over here is the internal capsule if this is the internal capsule what is this what is this if this is the internal capsule this is the i've already explained it to you guys this is the caudate nucleus if this is the caudate nucleus what is this this is the lentiform nucleus lentiform nucleus with globus pallidus and putamen isn't it globus pallidus and putamen what is this black chotu structure that you are seeing it is the it is the lateral ventricle lateral ventricle anterior horn of the lateral ventricle what is this structure that i have marked over here this black somewhat gray structure that you are seeing this is the caudate nucleus and this white structure that you see over here is the internal capsule this structure is the thalamus and this is the 
lentiform nucleus. This is the lentiform nucleus. So thalamus is bounded medially by the, what is this third ventricle? Laterally by this internal capsule, more specifically the posterior limb of the internal capsule. It is continuous anteriorly with the metathalamus. Okay. This is the boundaries of the thalamus. Now, if I have to look at the sagittal view, this is the thalamus as you can see. It's the thalamus and what is this? This is the lateral ventricle and this is the, what is this? This is the fornix. This is the corpus callosum, right? And uh, you can, of course, see the cerebellum here, pons, midbrain and everything. So, this is the location of thalamus in the mid, in the sagittal section. Yes, look at this. So, it is present in the middle of the cerebral hemisphere. So, this is the thalamus, which is the relay station. One more uh, section that I have put over here. And uh, what, what are these two structures, guys? We've already gone through this. What is this? This is the corpora quadrigemina. What is this structure? Superior colliculus. What is this? Inferior colliculus. Superior colliculus, what uh, nuclei lies there? Third nerve. Inferior is fourth nerve. And what else can we see? What peduncle is this? This is this is middle cerebral peduncle. Sorry, middle cerebellar peduncle. Correct? We have already gone through this. Diagram, what is this only nerve that comes out posteriorly like this? Trochlear nerve. Correct? What is this structure? What is this structure? This is the striae medullaris. What is this structure? This, the one that I'm marking over here. This is the hypoglossal triangle. It separates the vestibular. What separates the vestibular area from the hypoglossal triangle? It is the striae medullaris. And what is this? Gracile tubercle, cuneatus tubercle. What are gracile and cuneatus tubercle? What nuclei lies there? Nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. Nucleus gracilis carries what sensations? What sensations? Where vibration, proprioception from upper limb or lower limb? Lower limb. Then cuneate tubercle has nucleus cuneatus. So this is the dorsal column pathway which passes through here. So in, in this section also, in this section also, we can see the thalamus. Okay, where exactly is the thalamus present here? It is somewhere here. This is the thalamus. Now, thalamus is a large ma mass of gray matter that lies immediately lateral to the third ventricle as we have already seen. Correct? Now, it is an ovine nuclear mass about 4 cm long which borders with the dorsal part of the third ventricle. Basically, we have two thalamus like this and this is where the third ventricle is present. Okay, now... Thalamus has two poles, anterior pole, which lies behind the interventricular foramen because if here is the lateral, um, you know, lateral ventricles and interventricular foramen is here. So, anterior pole lies behind the interventricular foramen. Posterior pole is also called as the pulvinar that lies just above the lateral to the superior colliculus. So, superior colliculus and inferior colliculus are like this. This posterior pole lies just above and lateral to the superior colliculus. This is a superior colliculus. Now look at this guys. This part, this entire part is the thalamus and posteriorly this part is the pulvinar part and this is where you see the superior colliculus. This is the midbrain part, isn't it? Now this is the med pons and medulla oblongata you can see and here you can see the cerebellum also. Then this part is the thalamus part. This is the anterior pole and this is the posterior pole and here you can see the interventricular foramina clearly. Next, in the dorsal surface, I'm saying if if I have to look at the dorsally, like suppose I'm holding the brain like this and I'm, I've removed everything and I'm looking at the uh, dorsal surface of the thalamus, it is covered by a thin layer of white matter called a stratum zonae. It extends laterally from the line of reflection of the ependema and forms the roof of the third ventricle. Look at this diagram, guys. Now, where is the third ventricle present? This, this entire area is the third ventricle, isn't it? Now, this posterior aspect of the thalamus is for what forms the roof of the third ventricle. This curved surface is separated from the overlying body of the fornix by the choroid fissure and tela <coughs> choroida within it. More, <coughs> excuse me, more laterally, it forms the floor of the lateral ventricles, okay, related laterally to the caudate nucleus. Why? Because where is caudate nucleus? If this is the lateral ventricles and here is the caudate nucleus and then this is where the thalamus is present. So, caudate nucleus 
also forms a lateral boundary to the uh, thalamus. Okay, just another same picture. Now look at the medial surface. Now the medial surface of the thalamus is the dorsal part of the lateral wall of the third ventricle. It forms the dorsal part of the lateral wall of the third ventricle. It is usually connected by the contralateral thalamus by an interthalamic addition behind the interventricular foramina, not so important for us. Now, the boundary with the thalamus is marked by an indistinct hypothalamic sulcus, which curves from the upper end of the cerebral aqueduct to the interventricular foramina. Again, not so important information, just for the completion sake, I have added all of this. Now, but thalamus is continuous with the midbrain tegmentum. This part is very, very important. And the, also with the subthalamus and the hypothalamus. Look at this. Look at this diagram, guys. Now, this is the thalamus. Correct? This portion is the thalamus and this is the midbrain. Right? The anterior uh, uh, surface of the midbrain is called as? This anterior surface of the midbrain is called as tegmentum. The posterior surface of the mid midbrain is called as tectum. So, the thalamus that I am having over here is continuous with the anterior surface of the midbrain, which is also called as tegmentum, which is also called as tegmentum. Tegmentum also forms the posterior boundary of the third ventricle, which we have already discussed in the previous class. Look at this. This is the tegmentum of the Midbrain, this is the hypothalamus. The medial surface continues further as the tegmentum of the midbrain. Okay, the posterior surface is called as tectum. Correct. Now, coming to the inferior surface of the thalamus, this is related to hypothalamus anteriorly and the ventral thalamus posteriorly. Now, ventral thalamus separates the thalamus from tegmentum of the midbrain. All right. Now, up until now, whatever we have studied, we have studied just for the sake of completion, correct? We have studied just to, you know, uh, to know where exactly the thalamus is situated and what are the relations are. But now, this is the most important aspect of thalamus where you have so many questions coming, okay? Now, thalamus mainly consists of gray matter because you see all of this nuclei that is present here, they're all the part of gray matter. Okay, now superior surface is already covered with a thin layer of white matter called as stratum zonae, not very important for us. Now, lateral surface is covered by a similar layer which is called as external medullary layer. Okay, again, now the important aspect of thalamus starts here. Internally, the thalamus is divided into anterior. Okay medial and lateral nuclear groups by a Y-shaped sheath which is called as internal medullary lamina. This Y-shaped sheath that you are seeing is what is called as internal medullary lamina. This is called as internal medullary lamina. Now, if you look at the thalamus, like how it is divided, this anterior part forms the anterior nucleus. This lateral part, you know, if suppose if you, uh, you know, imagine this to be the thalamus, this lateral part forms the lateral nuclei, correct? The medial part forms the medial nucleus. So, this Y-shaped structure, which is called as the internal med medullary lamina, divides the entire thalamus into three parts, okay? The first part is the anterior part. Then we have the lateral part. Then we have the medial part. Okay. Next. Coming to the nuclei in the lateral part. Suppose if this is the thalamus I have. This is the Y-shaped lamina that I have. Now the nuclei in the lateral part is further divided into two. Okay. It is further divided into two. First part is the ventral group. The group of nuclei that lies over here is the ventral group. Second part is the dorsal group. The group of nuclei lies in this part is the dorsal group. The ventral group of nuclei is further divided into ventral anterior, ventral lateral or ventral, ventral intermediate and ventral posterior. Whereas the dorsal is further divided into lateral dorsal or dorsolateral or posterolateral or 
lateral posterior. Finally, we have the biggest of it is the pulvinar. Okay, so basically, I'm repeating it. Suppose if this is the thalamus that I have, thalamus is divided into three parts by this lamina, correct? This is the anterior part, medial part, this is the medial part and this part is the lateral part. Lateral part is further divided into two structures or two parts by this. Now, the first part is called as the ventral part. The second part is called as the dorsal part. Ventral part is further divided into three different groups, ventral anterior, venterolateral, ventral posterior, whereas the lateral group is further divided into lateral dorsal lateral posterior and pulvina. That's it. Now, other thalamic nuclei which are there, uh, uh, you know, uh, like intralaminar, which is uh, embedded within the inter internal medullary lamina, there is midline nuclei, there is medial and lateral geniculate bodies, which these are important. These two, internal laminary and midline nuclei is not so important, but medial and lateral geniculate body are the ones which are the most important. Medial geniculate body, M for music. Music is connected to auditory cortex. Lateral L for light is connected to visual pathway. Visual pathway. Now, if I have to ask you a question, which part of the midbrain, it's a question to you guys, which part of the midbrain is connected to auditory pathway? We have two brachiums, right? Superior brachium and inferior brachium, which is connected to superior colliculus and inferior colliculus. Correct? Now, superior brachium is connected to which? MGB or LGB? Inferior brachium is connected to what? MG or LGB? It's a question of the day for you guys. Okay? Just go back to midbrain and learn. Superior brachium is connected to whether MGB or LGB, inferior brachium is connected to MGB or LGB. This is a question for you guys. Okay. Now, look at this. The diagram that I had drawn, simple. This is the medial group and this is the dorsal group. This is the anterior group. Simple. When you draw the thalamus, even in your uh, you know physiology, just make a simple diagram like this. This becomes the anterior. This becomes the medial. Just divide the lateral into anterior uh, so ventral and dorsal and make three divisions like this pulminar be the biggest that's it this is a simple line diagram that you will have to draw for your examinations now let us look at the thalamic connections pretty much everything in our body every sensation whether it is motor whether it is sensory will have to pass through the thalamus Okay, so afferent impulse from a very large number of all subcortical centers, they converge to the thalamus. Okay, now visual and auditory impulse reach the lateral and the medial geniculate bodies. Correct? Any doubt in this? Very simple. Then sensation of the taste are co uh, conveyed to the thalamus through solitary thalamic nucleus. What is this? Nucleus of Practice solitarius. This NTS nucleus is connected to thalamus, which through which the taste sensations are carried. Okay. Thalamus does not receive any direct olfactory impulses. They probably reach through the amygdaloid complex. This is a very, very, very important question, guys. What is that one sensory pathway that does not pass through thalamus? And that is smell or olfaction. Thalamus also receives numerous connections from cerebral cortex, cerebellum, corpus striatum and so on. Now, let's look at the question here. Damage to thalamus can result in which of the following clinical manifestations? What is the question? Damage to the thalamus can result in which of the following clinical manifestations? Number one, visual field defects. Hmm, question mark. Can result because if this is a thalamus here itself, I have the MGB. And here itself, you have the LGB, yeah, may cause, I don't know. Auditory hall hallucinations, definitely no. Because auditory hallucination is a, is a symptom of schizophrenia. Definitely damage to thalamus will not cause any auditory hallucination. This option is gone. Loss of sensations from upper and lower limb. Again, they haven't specified what sensations 
Next, loss of voluntary muscle control, definitely not because there is no damage to pyramidal tract as such. So I cannot say that. So out of these two, visual field defects is highly unlikely because they haven't mentioned any particular uh, you know, reference to LGB. So I cannot say that it is visual field defects, but loss of sensation from upper and lower limb is the answer for this because every sensation from upper and lower limb, whether it is pain, temperature, proprioception, conscious and unconscious, sorry, unconscious goes to cerebellum, proprioception and uh, uh, vibration, fine touch, crude touch, all of these sensations eventually have to go to thalamus. From there, it goes to cortex, right? So any sensation from upper and lower limb when it is lost, I'm suspecting a lesion in the thalamus. Therefore, thalamus is regarded as the integrating center where all the information from all the sources is brought together. From the thalamus, it is projected into cerebral cortex through thalamocortical projections. Correct? These thalamocortical projections are called as thalamic radiations. Now, what are these thalamic radiations? First, superior thalamic radiation, posterior thalamic radiation, and ventral thalamic radiations. We have three different thalamic radiations. That's it. Superior, posterior, anterior relations. From because look at the size of the thalamus. If this is the size of the thalamus, this is the size of the cortex. Now, to be able to reach, to be able to reach the, uh, you know, cortex and then supply it, I need this radiation of fibers. They, the fibers come from thalamus and they radiate like this, right? Fibers, they cannot just send it like this. What it does is it radiates the fiber. It radiates the fibers like this so that it reaches the appropriate areas of the thalamus. So in that, this area is the superior, this is the anterior, and this is the posterior. This area is the posterior. Now, what are the connections of the ventral group of nuclei? Only you have to remember the ventral group because uh, these are specific connections. The non-specific connections is there, which we are not supposed to, or which I would suggest that you don't have to know it. Okay. Now, look at it, guys. So first, take the example of all the ventral. Okay. Take the example of ventral. And then, oh, I don't have a uh, this nucleus. I mean, I don't have a um, empty slide. That's okay. Now, look at the cerebral cortex sensory area 312. Okay. If it is the sensory area 312, what kind of sensations do you expect to go there? Number one, pain, temperature and all of this. Pain, temperature and all of this is a part of dorsal column pathway. Dorsal column pathway forms what? Lemniscus. Medial lemniscus. Similarly, I also have vibrations, proprioceptions and everything which come from the spinothalamic tract. Correct? The spinothalamic tract also will have to go to the same, uh, you know, the somatosensory area of cerebral cortex. Agree? Yes. So that means, obviously, I will have the relay of these two tracts at some uh, nucleus of the thalamus. Question is, what nucleus does it go and relate to? Okay, next. We also have trigeminothalamic tract. So what is this trigeminothalamic tract? All of the sensations from the face, right? Whether it is a pain, temperature from the face and also taste, right? Any sensation from the face and any sensation from the body will have to go to the thalamus. And the nuclei that it goes to is the ventral posterior nucleus. This ventral posterior nucleus, suppose if I have to write the nuclei like this, ventral nuclei, so this is ventral anterior, this is ventral intermediate, this is ventral posterior, which has two parts, ventroposteromedial, ventroposterolateral. So this VP venteroposterior nucleus is the one which gets sensations from the body as well as from the face. Look at it, guys. VPM, M means mouth. Where is mouth present? Mouth is present on the face. So what pathway do carry the sensations from the face to the thalamus is trigeminothalamic tract. And also fibers from the NTS, nucleus tractus solitarius. Whereas lateral L for limbs. Limbs means body. All the body sensations which are carried by medial lemniscus and spinothalamic tract, they go to the ventroposterior 
you know uh, ventral posterior nucleus from here they go to 312 area one thing is sorted after 312 area what else do we have now if you look at the uh, broadman areas first we have the 312 area correct then we have area 4 which is the motor area and here is the premotor area correct premotor and supplementary motor area is present before the sensory area 312 right now from the posterior part i have the what else was there here from the ventro posterior part i had the sensation from the body and the face coming to the medial part in the ventro lateral nucleus coming to the medial part i have all the sensations from the substantia nigra and from the anterior part i have sensations from the globus pallidus that go into area number 4 okay now totally looking at the lateral group of nucleuses <coughs> that is the non specific group of nucleuses which is not so important for us don't bother about this i have just included for the completion sake what we need to know the more important ones are these now in the ventral group of nuclei ventral posterior divided into medial and the lateral part receives all the sensory information whereas ventral lateral nucleus in receives information from all the motor chains or the motor tracts okay this is not very important for us i mean it's I've just included this for the sake of completion because it's very very complicated and i wouldn't want you to bother much with this then medial and lateral geniculate bodies are the oval collections of the gray matter situated the below the posterior part of the thalamus traditionally they are under the metathalamus but functionally they are under thalamus okay yeah then mgb is the relay station of the auditory pathway correct mgb receives fibers from the lateral lemniscus correct mgb what are the three lemniscus that we have medial lemniscus trigeminal lemniscus and lateral lemniscus medial lemniscus is the dorsal column pathway trigeminal lemniscus is the trigeminal uh, fibers lateral is from the auditory pathway correct always always remember guys lemniscus is formed only after the decussation so all of the neurons that are forming lemnisci are always second order neurons these points about lemniscus is very 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 important for us okay next fibers arising from the medial geniculate bodies they constitute the acoustic radiation not so important for for us then let's go to the lgb lgb is the relay station for the visual pathway it receives fibers from retina of the both the eyes i hope you know from retina it becomes the optic nerve then optic chiasma then optic tract optic radiation finally it goes into the uh, occipital lobe where the auditory uh, sorry visual cortex is present so where is lgb coming into picture out of all this where is lgb coming into pictures optic tracts they end in the lgb from there the optic radiations arise which go so when i talk about or spoke about the thalamic radiations here guys this posterior thalamic radiations are nothing but my optic radiations why is it posterior where is the occip occipital lobe present it is present in the posterior area thalamus is much anterior from the eyes the fibers enter into the thalamus from the thalamus they go into the occipital lobe this posterior is what is called as the, the fibers are moving from anterior to posterior and this posterior thalamic radiation radiations are the ones which are called as the optic radiations optic radiations okay then connections of the lgb again which is not so important for us now what is the blood supply of the thalamus perforating branches of the posterior cerebral arteries because of its proximity to the cerebral hemispheres and of course there are some thalamic perforating arteries and posterior lateral group is from the thalamo genticulate branches also receives branches from the posterior communicating arteries now we have something called as thalamic syndromes which have only included for the sake of completion if you are really really interested in it you can go through this let's go to the blood supply of the brain which again takes a lot of time i hopefully we finish it now the entire blood supply of the brain and the spinal cord depends upon the two systems 
first is the vertebral artery which arises from the subclavian artery second is the internal carotid artery which is a branch of the common carotid one set of arteries come from behind they are the vertebral arteries one set of arteries come from the front which is the internal carotid arteries together they supply the brain okay yes now brain receives about 15% of the resting cardiac output and accounts for 25% of body's o2 consumption so brain is extremely sensitive to hypoxia even if there is some 20 seconds of uh, hypoxia is good enough to seize all the electrical activity in the brain 3 to minutes of 4 uh, minutes of brain ischemia leads to irreversible brain damage that is a reason why you should be able to pick up the strokes faster if a patient comes to you with slurring of speech all every second that is spent is golden for us okay now arterial supply of the brain so 80% of the blood supply of telencephalon and diencephalon goes from the ica about 20% is from the vertebral arteries vertebral arteries mainly supply the brain stem and the cerebellum okay now internal carotid artery ica ica is a branch of common carotid artery this is the carotid sheath uh, car uh, common carotid artery branches into ica and it continues as ECA i hope you know this basic information now what is the starting point of ICA it arises in the point at the point in the neck which is the foramen lacerum and enters into the cavernous sinus where common carotid arteries bifurcate into external and internal carotid arteries i think there is some something wrong here it's this this point is wrong okay it does not it, it arises in the neck and it enters the cranial cavity at the foramen lacerum okay it enters into the Uh, uh cranial cavity via the foramen lacerum and then it enters into the cavernous sinus where it undergoes a bend and then it further continues gives off ophthalmic artery and so on okay now common carotid artery in the neck gives rise to internal carotid artery and continues as external carotid artery now this external carotid artery goes on to supply the face whereas the internal carotid artery enters the cavernous sinus through the foramen lacerum and enters the subarachnoid space by piercing the arachnoid matter and lies lateral to the optic chiasma what are the different branches of the internal carotid artery now internal carotid arteries branch to form two major cerebral arteries that is anterior and middle cerebral arteries which is very very important first of all internal carotid artery as it comes and enters the cranial cavity through the foramen of lacerum becomes a content of the cavernous sinus along with the sixth cranial nerve after it leaves the cavernous sinus it undergoes a bend like this which is called as carotid siphon and then it starts giving off branches starts giving off branches okay as it leaves the cavernous sinus as i've shown in the diagram it gives rise to ophthalmic artery and bifurcates into anterior and middle cerebral arteries it actually bifurcates into anterior and middle cerebral artery but it also gives rise to anterior choroidal artery and posterior communicating artery so as it leaves the cavernous sinus the first artery that gives is the ophthalmic artery then it bifurcates into anterior and the middle cerebral arteries and also gives rise to anterior choroidal and posterior communicating artery okay now internal carotid artery the first branch it gives is the ophthalmic artery and it bifurcates as middle cerebral and anterior cerebral artery where mca is a very important artery and also gives posterior uh, communicating and choroidal artery choroidal artery goes on to supply the internal capsule it's a major artery of the internal capsule now ophthalmic artery it passes into the orbit through the optic foramen it supplies the structure of the orbit hence the name ophthalmic artery anterior choroidal artery it supplies the optic tract choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle hippocampus and some of the deep structures including the internal capsule so this anterior choroidal artery is a major artery of the internal capsule if there is any problem with of the then a hemorrhage or any ischemia it results in 
very very dangerous manifestations next posterior communicating artery it passes posterior and inferior to optic tract and joins the posterior cerebral artery along with the middle cerebral artery next aca anterior cerebral artery it passes medially above the optic nerve passes into the great longitudinal fissure between the frontal lobes where it joins the corresponding vessels of the opposite side by anterior communicating artery okay the territory supplied by it includes mainly the motor and sensor cortices of the lower limb so now look at this guys aca mainly supplies the motor and uh, sensory aspects of lower limb okay if a patient comes to you with lower limb manifestation suspect aca okay now look at this this is the superolateral surface and this is the medial surface looking at this you should be able to tell what arteries supply what are the dominant arteries in this particular section now look at the in the superior art uh, you know superior lateral surface the dominant artery is mca mca is involving very important structures speed structures this is the broca's area and here is the motor speed structure wernicke's area so any time if any patient comes to you with speech difficulty speech abnormality along with uh, symptoms of stroke always always suspect middle cerebral artery because this supplies the majority of the temporal lobe and also some part of the parietal lobe whereas anterior cerebral artery as you can see this is the 312 and this is the motor sensory homunculus if you see here is where we see the lower limb so anterior cerebral artery whenever is involved majorly majorly involves the lower limb whereas the mca always always whenever a patient is coming to you with speech difficulty suspect mca stroke and of course we have the occipital area we have the posterior cerebral arteries whereas if you look at the medial surface we have the posterior cerebral artery supplying the occipital lobe and the anterior cerebral artery becomes the dominant artery here and anterior cerebral becomes the dominant whereas mca supplies the small part of the temporal lobe okay now in case of any anterior choroidal occlusion we have amnesia alzheimers medial temporal lobe epilepsy and so on but mca occlusion is something that's going to cause very very dangerous um symptoms and it, it it results in deleterious effects for the patients okay hemisensory loss mainly involving the face and the arm because it involves the precentral and postcentral gyri aphasia why aphasia because look at the diagram guys it is involving the very very important speech structures broca's as well as wernicke's area contralateral homonymous hemianopia as well next let's look at the vertebro basilar system vertebral arteries they arise from the subclavian arteries okay and then they enter into the spinal cord and they finally <coughs> join to form anterior and posterior spinal arteries okay these spinal arteries as from the spi uh, uh, you know right subclavian artery you can see how the vertebral artery goes come goes and goes and goes and it gets joined by the opposite side vertebral artery to form the basilar artery okay these two vertebral arteries from the subclavian artery enters the cranial cavity through the foramen magnum where it gives rise to three branches number one posterior spinal artery number 2 anterior spinal artery number 3 posterior inferior cerebral artery this is very important called as pica pica is a branch of vertebral arteries which supplies the posterior and inferior aspect of the cerebellum posterior and inferior aspect of the cerebellum is actually supplied by pica next two vertebral arteries give rise to this artery which is my basilar artery okay left and the right arteries they join together to form the basilar arteries which unite at the junction between the medulla and pons to form the basilar artery actually these arteries run over this anterior structure of the pons okay basilar artery runs over the anterior structure of the uh, pons it gives rise to number 1 antero inferior cerebral artery 
Number two, superior cerebral artery. Of course, spontine arteries because it runs over the pons, labyrinthine arteries and posterior cerebral arteries. What are the different arteries uh, given by basilar artery? Number one, very easy to remember, pontine artery because it runs over the pons. Number two, it gives rise to ICA. Then it also gives rise to superior cerebral artery, labyrinthine artery, which is actually, uh, you know, labyrinthine artery can be said that it's a branch of anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And also it gives rise to posterior cerebral artery. Okay, important, very important, the brain stem, cerebellum and occipital lobe, all of this is supplied by this vertebro basilar system. Whereas the cerebrum, cerebral cortex, parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, all of that, all of those lobes are supplied by ICA system. Whereas the posterior aspect of brain stem, cerebellum, all of this is supplied by vertebro basilar system. Okay, now pontine arteries. Name only says it supplies the pons, ICA, it supplies the anterior and inferior portion of the cerebellum. Cerebellum is supplied by pica and ICA. Right? Labyrinthine artery, name only as, as it suggests, it supplies the inner ear, occlusion leads to vertigo and so on. Superior cerebellar artery also supplies the another, uh, you know, uh, SCA, superior cerebellar artery also supplies the superior aspect of the cerebellum, posterior cerebral artery, it curves around the midbrain to supply the visual cortex and occipital lobe. Whenever you hear the word posterior, wherever, it has got something to do with occipital lobe, that much you can remember. Look at this beautiful system, guys. So from here, the two vertebral arteries join together to form the basilar artery. And also they gave off the anterior spinal artery and pica, which is going and supplying the cerebellum. Basilar artery, which is running on the surface of pons. If I have to draw pons, this is where the pons is. Okay. It is running on the surface of the pons and it is giving pontine branches, superior cerebellar artery and also posterior cerebral arteries. Correct. Whereas posterior communicating artery is actually coming from MCA. As you can see, MCA is a direct continuation of ICA. Right. ICA directly continues as MCA. Now, this further, after giving of pontine arteries, the basilar artery ends by dividing into posterior cerebral arteries. Now, these posterior cerebral arteries are joined together by the posterior communicating arteries of the MCA. And this posterior communicating artery, as it joined by the MCA, further joins the anterior, uh, anterior cerebral artery via the anterior communicating artery, thus forming this circle of willis you can clearly see how all of these arteries are joined to each other all of these arteries are joined to one another to form a circle why is there a circle of willis in the first place guys why do we have a circle of willis in the first place let's say for example i have an arterial occlusion somewhere here when I have the arterial occlusion somewhere here, the part that is supplying, the part that this artery is supplying, let's say these are the different parts that it is supplied, will undergo ischemia. Brain is extremely sensitive to hypoxia. So, in order to make sure that this part gets the blood supply, I have all of these connections. Let's suppose that this artery is damaged here. MCA senses or the arteries over here senses that, okay, this artery is damaged and I need to supply this area of the brain as well. It, it then auto-regulates and because of the auto-regulation, a lot of brain from the MCA further goes here and it ends up supplying the affected part so that this part of the brain, this part of the brain, this tissue remains viable. Because... The brain is so sensitive to hypoxia. God has created beautiful system. God has created this interconnection between the arteries, which is called as the circle of villus. Okay. This circle of villus is present at the base of the brain in the interpeduncular fossa. What else is present in the interpeduncular fossa, guys? Tubercinarium, oculomotor nerve, posterior perforating substance. Remember, where is interpeduncular fossa present? 
interpeduncular fossa is present in midbrain remembering all of the structures that we have over there optic chiasma mammillary bodies posterior perforating substance i hope you remember getting orientation about where what i'm talking about it is formed by anterior and middle cerebral branches of the ica and posterior cerebral branches of the basilar artery okay circle of willis is a system between my ica and basilar artery okay two anterior cerebral arteries are connected to each other by anterior communicating middle and posterior communicating artery of the same side are uni united by the posterior communicating artery guys always remember posterior communicating artery is a branch of mca it's not a branch of basilar system we think that pca is a branch of basilar system but it's not okay this is the circle of willis this is a beautiful structure all five arteries that we are seeing is the circle of willis where is the anterior communicating anterior cerebral posterior communicating posterior cerebral artery okay and this is the basilar artery this beautiful structure which makes sure that even though when there is ischemia other parts of the arteries other parts they take over and make sure that the part that affected remains viable that beautiful structure god has created is the circle of willis okay let's take some questions now posterior cerebral artery is a branch of which major artery is it a branch of internal carotid what is this posterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery now let's look at the diagram to find out posterior cerebral is a branch of which artery okay internal carotid is here in direct continuation of mca okay it is giving rise to posterior communicating artery and here it is giving rise to anterior communicating where is posterior cerebral posterior cerebral is here it is a branch of basilar artery basilar artery in fact continues as posterior cerebral artery okay once vertebral artery is joined it form the basilar artery basilar arteries further continue as this posterior cerebral arteries which further are joined by the posterior communicating this is the mca this is anterior communicating and these two are the anterior cerebral arteries so this region is what is the circle of willis okay now this posterior cerebral is a branch of my basilar artery damage to middle cerebral artery can lead to deficits in which of the following functions visual perceptions not really because mainly uh, you know uh, anything that is related to posterior let's say posterior cerebral posterior cerebellar so all of these posterior ones are supplying the occipital lobe so it's unlikely that mca territory will cause any visual defects motor control of lower limbs again no why i explained to you aca damage anterior cerebral artery damage is what causes motor control of lower limbs auditory processing again no regulation of body temperature again no it, it actually is a i'm sorry this should have been anterior cerebral artery so that damage to anterior cerebral artery can result in motor control loss of motor control of lower limb aca territory when it is damaged it causes motor control of lower limbs will be lost mca will result in much much more severe form of stroke only lower limb when it is lost it is the aca territory okay i hope you found today's class to be useful and i uh, you know uh, really hope that you are you are making best use of these classes and you are enjoying these classes and uh, today's session although not so important for your entrance examination or oh, sorry uh, for your board examination but i'm sure one or two questions will come from today's topic thalamus is majorly a physiology topic but circle of willis and blood supply to the uh, blood supply of the brain is quite important i hope you have understood very easy concepts very easy to understand just go through the same things again and again and i'm sure you will ace your examination okay thank you so much if you have any doubts you can always follow us and uh, across all the social media handles you can ask me doubts uh, by connecting to us over here and uh, tomorrow sessions we'll be starting with cranial nerves and cadaveric sections and so on and keep studying keep reading i'm sure you will pass the exams thank you guys thank you so much and i wish you all the very best and uh, good night thank you